Welcome to an episode of I Know I Know a Solo Beatles podcast where we all talk things Beatles and solo. It's a mix, honestly. It's never one or the other. It's always both. Now, we've got a really great episode because this is the first time that I am giving you the opportunity to win what we're talking about. You can win a signed copy of this mystery guest's new book, Shades of Life, part one. Um, she is a returning guest. Um, Jude, welcome back to the show. Oh, thank you, Hudson, for having me. I always, always look forward to talking with you, and I really do appreciate it. And I um, really look forward on this day. You know, when John passed, it was the ninth in Liverpool. Yeah. And so it's, you know, he was born on the ninth, died on the ninth in his hometown, um, went his first home was nine Newcastle Road. And of course, Brian discovered them on November the 9th. Yeah. And so it is here. Great to be here on number nine, number nine to talk about John. <laughs> it's always that number. It is. It is. I mean, you can trace it through his life. And, you know, he was well aware of it. And some of it, like Sean's birth, they could, you know, move around so that it was on that date. But many, many things happened to him on the night that were just quote unquote coincidence, you know? Yeah, like that number nine, like that's just scary, like how, how everything happens on the night. Yeah, and nine in our existence is a special number because, you know, in math, the property of casting out nines is just incredible. It is a, it's a very powerful number and it definitely, you know, played a role in his life. So um, it's just this, this is a, a day, yesterday I felt very sad and nostalgic and today I feel like, okay, he just passed over. He didn't pass away and he's yeah. still very much with us. You know, his famous quote that you're really not dead until the last person who remembers your name says it for the last time. And what gives me hope that he will always be alive is that you are just as passionate about the Beatles as I am. And I have a feeling that your children will be as well and that the heritage will be passed down from generation to generation. Well, thank you. My kids, like, will not allow to be listen to any other music unless it's Beatles <laughs> music. Um, or they don't are. do that because you know what will happen they'll rebel and they'll hate the Beatles <laughs> yeah well if they don't like the Beatles they're not allowed to live on my property oh my I, I'm kidding but <laughs> you just bring them up right and they will they will be they'll grow up listening yeah. to good night and all of the beautiful boy and all of those songs that will be a part of their nature and nurture yeah. Um, now, I want to briefly mention and give a shout out to our friend Ken Womack, because we got the announcement of the Mal Evans book. And oh, my gosh. Huge. Just so huge. I mean, first of all, I would like to know what he eats for breakfast, because he did last year. John Lennon, 1980 solid state on um, heavy road um the book that he did on eric eric clapton with jason crump all things must pass and he was working for months on this mal evans biography with all of these photos that no one has ever seen before i mean where does he get the energy is what i want to know he's the energizer bunny See, I said that to him and he just hung his head and I said, well, no, 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 I don't mean like fuzzy and pink. And he goes, no, I'm okay with fuzzy and pink. So, <laughs> but he yes, you're right. He, I do not understand from whence he cometh, you know? Yeah. Like whatever you're having for breakfast, please give it to us. We want it. Yeah, yeah, we want it. Or at least we would like a seminar on how to organize your life so that that is possible. Yeah, or how the man must not sleep. 
No, I, I, his wife one time when we were at the Monmouth conference in 2018, the White Album Conference, which was probably one of the greatest experiences of my entire life. She said to me, I sometimes just go in and sit on the sofa where Ken is working so that I can just see him. And, you know, I, he's got to work all the time. Yeah. But he, I think for him, it's not work. And what is that old quote about if you make your pleasure or your passion, your work, you will never work a day in your life. Right. And I, I think that's the way he feels, you know, he's doing what he loves. Yeah. And I mean, the guy, the guy teaches a Beatles class at a college. <laughs> like, yeah. I yeah. Mean, and that, that's a dream. <laughs> and runs a listening club every Tuesday night at the university yeah. and does a Beatles related uh, show of everything Fab Four, of people that were lo loosely associated with the Beatles. He just does so much. And here's the thing. There's some people in the Beatles world that have written like 50 books and they're okay, but they are in no way the caliber of Ken's books. Ken's book, Long and Winding Roads, The Evolving Artistry of the Beatles, is perhaps one of the finest books I have ever, it's in my top five of Beatles books. And it changed my whole perspective on the Beatles because when I read it, I was like, I wonder if this guy, I know Ken at that point, I wonder if this guy is telling the truth because if he is telling the truth, then the Beatles are so much deeper than I ever dreamed that they were. He made them a pop-up to me. It was no yeah. longer, you know, it became a pop-up book. So he's not only prolific, he is so deep and so articulate and so right. Yes. And he also, I mean, he released two books last year. Like, I don't know how Three. many. Three, right? John Lennon, 1980. No, that was Solid. 2020. Oh, was it 2020? But three, two books this year. Okay. Solid State. And Solid all State was... Well, he did Fandom and the Beatles with Kit and All Things Must Pass. Solid State was early 2020. Okay. See, I didn't even list Fandom and the Beatles because I really didn't know about that one. So shame on me. The queen might be after you for that. <laughs> I will get myself straight. <laughs> I have to order that immediately. I don't understand it. That even blows my mind even more. I just... Um, I don't know how he does it. That's all I have to say. Yeah, I don't know either, but please help us with your formulas. Yeah. <laughs> so moving on to your books, I want to ask you, what was like, I know you were a college professor at one point. Like, was writing always a passion for you? Um, yes, I... Um... I probably, you and I probably have a lot more in common than we know, because I was a very serious student. Um, I went to summer school every summer because my parents worked full time and they really didn't know what to do with me other than put me in summer school. And so when I got to my senior year in high school, I had taken everything there was to take. And so they said, well, we don't really know what we'll do with her as a student, the school board, because she's taken everything except for English four, you can take that and a PE. So the rest of the day, I went on to college at, at 15 and um, got my, I decided that I wanted to write and I wanted to write about historical figure, but I wanted to write it as a narrative, not knowing at that point, of course, that I would have to footnote everything. But I wanted to write in the heritage of Michener and Irving Stone to make the story very real and as if you were there, a fly on the wall. And so I got two degrees in one in English, liberal arts, and one in history in, in education in three years. So I took 177 hours in three years. Oh, oh wow. And then went straight to the University of Maryland and started working on my master's degree, which I did in, the, in a year and a half and I then collapsed. So, uh, you know, I was like 20, almost 21 and finished and done. And 
but I knew I was preparing myself to write a book, a, a definitive book on someone. Um, I wanted to be Bosworth to Johnson. I wanted to tell someone's story. And so I've told you before, I, I got to the point where I was ready to start doing the research and I thought, all right, I'm going to spend my life doing this. Who do I want to write about? And I thought, well, the only person I know everything there is to know about is John Lennon. And honestly, what I knew about John Lennon at that point, I could put in this Diet Coke cap. Um, I knew zippity doo da day, nothing about John Lennon. I knew what I'd read in fanzines and some of that wasn't even true, you know, and so as I started to gather like a 500 book Lennon and Beatles library and um, periodicals, and at that point it was tapes, little cassette tapes, uh, audio tapes and all that, I thought, okay, now I know it all. I know it, I'm ready to write. And then I thought, oh, I've never even been to Liverpool. Who am I kidding? I don't know anything. So I started going to Liverpool and doing an interview in the morning, an interview in the afternoon, an interview in the evening. And man, the interviews in the evening were, oh yeah, something to behold. Because in Liverpool, a lot of these Beatles people started drinking in the grapes at 11 and I would get them about seven. And oh, the stories were really good. <laughs> you have tapes of those? No, I have tapes of one of them only who was it? Only Alan Williams, which I love. It is great. But what back in that day, Rand, my husband, was furiously, I have the notebook where he's taking notes. Just he's writing as fast as he can, you know. And as it evolved later on, we started recording them. But it was people like Helen Anderson, of course, who yeah. was John's, you know, big buddy in college. And Patty Delaney, the doorman at the Cavern Club, was still alive at that time. Um, a lot of John's professors, um, uh, of course, people that were in the early, in the Quarrymen, Chaz Newby, and that, and the whole group. Um, Bob Wooler, uh, uh, Rod Murray, who was at Gambier Terrace with Stu and John, who was supposed to be the Beatles bassist. He was making his own bass guitar when John had formed him. He was yeah. no longer. I, you know, so there was, it just was, it was a wonderful experience. But as you and I were talking about pre show, it took 20 years for me to gather all that information before I even started putting pen to paper. And I still don't know anything. I mean, the more you learn, the more you know what you don't know. Like John Bazzini, who uh, runs the Beatles in print together and solo on Facebook, yeah. has sent me some incredible, incredible rare files of John singing songs that I didn't even know existed. Um, there's so much I don't know. So my whole life is devoted to learning and, and sorting it out and trying to pass it along. And I think you've done that with the two books that I have read. Like, I mean, I, I knew nothing. <laughs> you and know so much. I cannot wait until these books get into the solo years because along, yeah. along with um, Leninology, which our friendship wrote, which I think volume two is going to be uh, around sometime soonish. Yes. We, it's the definitive John biography. Oh, no, no doubt. Yeah. No doubt. It's going to be, well, it, well, all total, it's, I started let's say 34 years ago, and it's going to take me at least another 18, 16 to 18 years to finish it. Was a, a whole lifetime will be dedicated to it. But I know I've already made mistakes. So many things in should have been there. I have to go back and change. That's the very first book. This is my beat up copy of it. This is the first edition. How Just, many copies do you still have? I have about four copies of this that are left. Um, I have none of Shivering Inside. I have one of She Loves You, Volume 3, because I want to give it to the Rock and Roll Hall yeah. of Fame. Uh, but I have not, no copy of Shivering Inside to give them. Uh, and I found one on thrift, no, not thrift books, maybe eBay the other day. 
that is being sold in England for 900 pounds. Well, I'm not going to be buying that. <laughs> I would write to them be like, I'm the author. Mine now. <laughs> I would really love to have the book, but you know, I, there are none of that. I have maybe two boxes of volume four, which is 1964. And by the way, um, there you go. I mean, you can work out with this baby, can't you? <laughs> you could run with one in each oh, hand. <laughs> Wouldn't that be? <laughs> that would be oh, the thing. <laughs> on, on the day John was born, you know, the old legend, which is not true, is that Mimi ran from Nine Newcastle Road to the maternity lying in hospital in downtown Liverpool. So I clocked it in the car. It's 3.2 miles. It's the perfect uh, 5k yeah and of course you gotta remember she was 36 and in the 1940s late 1930 19 it's 1940 36 year old women were were not young no. they were they were middle-aged and a little bit older and she had no running shoes and furthermore it was against the law to run after six o'clock at night it was lights out and this, you would have been arrested if you've yeah. been on the street running so we know that didn't happen even she scoffed at it but on the 9th of October next year, Hudson, you're going to have one book in each hand and you're going to run 3.2 miles in the Mimi run. <laughs> can you, can you do that? I, I might, but I'm going to have to like put the boxes that they came in <laughs> so they don't get ruined. <laughs> the Mimi run. And here he goes, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yeah. Now, yeah. What was in 19 now with the formatting of these books? Um, how do you self publish? Well, you and I were talking before the show about this book, The Day John Met Paul, yes. which Jim O'Donnell wrote. And um, I'm sure I've told you this story, but I've, after reading all these books, you can only see a small portion of them. They're all around me. I'm encased in Beatles books. Um, I, this is my favorite Beatles book. I've never written to an author ever. And I sat down and wrote to him and said, this is the most beautiful book that's ever been written on the Beatles. And I just appreciate what you've done. It's exquisite. And I just, I, I don't want to write this chapter about John and Paul meeting because you've written it so exquisitely that I'd like to just skip it, but I can't. Yeah, I have to write it, but it will never be as good as yours. So the man calls me. My son, I'm at work at the YMCA, I ran a large YMCA in Independence, Missouri. And my son calls me and says, some author from New York City just called you. And I was like, what? It must have been Jim O'Donnell. He said, he's calling you back tonight. So he called and said, why did you read my book? Why did you write me this? What is going on with you? And I told him the story. And he said, I'm going to give you some advice. And I want you to listen to me. We talked for about 20 minutes. He said, you do not even try to get a publisher because they will take your manuscript they will rip it open. They will dump it in the garbage can and send you a rejection letter. Unless you know someone, you will never get a publisher. So what I recommend is you're personable. You're not yeah. shy. And I want you to self-publish. Form your own publishing company, self-publish, and you tell the story. Well, most self-published authors sell 80 books. Eight, zero, yeah. that's it, 80. We just passed the 400,000 mark because I will tell anyone. I tell people in grocery stores. I tell people in parking lots. I hand out business cards everywhere to strangers. Um, I'm not shy no. about saying, have you read, have you heard about the book? You know, and so Ran, my husband, formed a company called uh, Pen and Ink Publishing. And the imprint that I use is On the Rock Books. And it's just a matter, of, COVID has been very difficult because yeah. I, I haven't been able to get out and sell. No. But I am going in um, 
January to Alexandria, Louisiana, about two and a half hours away to speak to the Rotary Club. I will talk to the Rotary Club. I will talk to the Garden Club. I will talk to the Newcomers Club. I will talk to whatever club wants to have me free of charge because I want John's story to be in the hands of readers. You know, last night I was looking on some John Lennon pages on Facebook, lots of John Lennon groups. Yeah. And I almost cried because I thought, all these names, I don't know. And I know people in my database. I know there are several thousand people. I know them all. And none of these names are in my database and how they would love this story, how this story would touch their hearts. But how do you get the word out? Right. You know? Wow. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a sad thing because I really think they would love sitting in the grapes or any crack with John in college. Oh. They would love being with him as he runs out on that field at Shea Stadium and looks around and walks and then runs and then sees Paul is going to beat him to the stage and runs ahead of Paul. So he's the first one up the stairs. They would, they would love this, but I don't know how to, I don't know how to tell everyone about it. I don't know. It, yeah. <laughs> You should like have like you know like in Times Square like a hope like one of those squares. <laughs> Happy Christmas by the book. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have you heard about the book? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gary Berman, who wrote "We're Going to See the Beatles," which is a great book about fans who actually you know got to see the Beatles, had a table next to me at the Fest for Beatles fans the first year I was there. And I never, I don't talk, I don't visit, I don't chat, I don't go to the bathroom, I don't eat, I just sell books. And he said, if I hear you say, have you heard about the book to one more person, I'm literally going to stab myself with a butter knife. <laughs> so what? You, gotta, you gotta do it. I said, if you're gonna write the book, you gotta sell the book. Right. It's, it's a model of business. Yeah. And, yeah. oh my gosh, like your energy level is so good. Well. I mean, the amount of effort, like you can tell that there is love and effort put in these books. Well, it is, I want, I wanted to do something different. I didn't want to do another book of facts about John. I wanted to, to be factual, or as Bill Harry calls it, factional. Um, I don't want to deviate because you can get sued. I mean, if you deviate yeah. from the truth, if you don't tell the exact truth, you know, this country, this world is litigious yeah. and you can get sued. I have to tell exactly what they did, what they said, what they ate, what they wore, but I wanted to do it so that people felt they were there. And they felt that when Cynthia got brave enough to attend the session that Paul and sometimes George would have in room 21, Arthur Ballard's room at Liverpool College of Art, they would get together at lunchtime and they would play different songs. And when she finally got the courage to go and stand and watch John, um, I want them to be standing with her and to feel what yeah. she felt, you know, and when he made some comment about Miss Powell being there um, to feel the thrill that she felt, you know, and I, I just, it has been, it is what I want to do with my life. And my sister just said yesterday, I really hate John Lennon because he has taken you away from me. And I said, but that wasn't my choice. That was what I was born to do. Yeah. So, you know. She's not a Beatle fan like you. Well, she is six years younger than I am, and she came up in the era of Pink Floyd, and, um, you know, it was diff yeah. a different sound of music, but I think it's not that. I think she's a Beatles fan somewhat. I think that I have given, I have given all my attention and all my time to this. My daughter-in-law, Paige, whom I love dearly, calls should have been there, her, her husband's little brother. She said, he, you know, he's the, the, should have been there as your second child. And that's, yeah, true. that's true. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, when, what, whatever you spend eight hours a day doing, yeah. that's who you, that's who you are. Yeah. Um, I don't spend 
eight hours a day podcasting just so yes yeah i i do sometimes but yeah like and when you're writing like do you just do this all like in a word doc yes i have a a manuscript format so i use the one from the time before and erase all the pages and keep the title page and the glossary and i change it as i go and the bibliography and change it as i go and all that but i keep that same format and then i type it because i want them all to be the same you know in fact this is the first time that we deviated away from brown tones to do a gray tone on shades of life and by the way my husband does the covers for all of them he the first cover was asteroids the second cover um jane bones and then we, he started doing, um, actually, Shannon, the great Beatles artist, Shannon, after we sold out of the Astrid covers and should have been there, she did an original portrait of John for the editions. I've, I've republished, should have been there five times. So editions three, four, and five are all Shannon oh, wow. originals. So Um, But then Rand started doing them. And I just love this one because I think it shows how sad and how distressed John is becoming by 1965. You can look in his eyes and see, you you know, it's like, yeah, and things are changing is a brilliant artist. He 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 really is. It's a shame that he doesn't pursue it more because he helps me so much. But he was selected by the largest art gallery in Louisiana as artist of the year several years ago and had to have 35 originals in a one-man show. It nearly killed him to to do that. But um, he is a very talented artist and really has given it all up to, like right now, we are getting the ebook ready of Shades of Life. And we had this great idea this time, me and my great ideas. I wanted to move the documentation to right after the chapter so that at the end of of each chapter, all the documentation was there because the book is annotated, there's extra info and I wanted people to be able to read the info instead of flipping to the back of the book. Read, flip, read, flip, read, flip. I didn't want them to have to do that. I wanted it to be at the end of the chapter. Well, Book Baby, Kindle, uh, what is the Barnes and Noble one? Um, Anyway, they will not allow you to have documentation in the middle of the book. So now we're having to reformat the entire book and move it to the back. And once you do that, all the pages slip and then you've got to go in and do the page breaks again and reformat everything. Well, he's doing that. So um, he spends a lot of time working on the book. It wouldn't happen without both of you. No, it, it takes a team. And it wouldn't happen without my editors. I mean, my bestie, Lena Stagg, whom you know so well, Um, she edits the book and she is the best of the best of the best editors Janet Davis who's the editor for Octopus's Garden and many other books Charles Rosanay's books Sarah Schmidt's books she does it Al Sussman executive editor for Beetle Fan is an editor praise the Lord because I had some bad mistakes like you know, because your your mind is on a thousand different things. And I would say, and when John and Paul met in 1968, and he's like, ah! <laughs> he's like, no, that's wrong. I'm like, oh, thank goodness. You know, you're just, you, you make mistakes and you have to have a lot, a lot of editors in order to make sure that you're not a typical fool. You know? Al is great. He is great. He, he knows everything. He does. He does. He's way better than Wikipedia. At the beginning of each segment for each month, I put what was going on in the world uh, at the same time that these things were happening. Right. So here's all the events from January, all the things that were going on. So I got all those events from Wikipedia. I would put January 1965 and it would come up with what happened and I would select the five most prominent things. Okay, 80% of the time, they were wrong. And Al yeah. caught all of it. And he's like, don't use Wikipedia for these things. If you want five things, I can tell you when they were. Don't, they're wrong. Al's, 
should put Wikipedia out of business. Yeah, no joke. Alipedia. Yeah. Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I have just really great editors. I could not do it without the people who were there. I mean, Ivor Davis has told me so many stories that are so much more correct than the way they've been exaggerated over the years. Um, Art Schreiber, who was there in 1964, a really good friend of John's who traveled with the Beatles for the Westinghouse Network. All these people tell their stories. And getting, Bruce Pfizer said to me, you know, anybody can patchwork a book of what someone else has written. You write, get 25 other Beatles books and you patchwork them into a book. But what's different is that you talk to the primary sources and you dig to ask the people who are there. And so all of those people, I, you know, I, it's been, this, this series has been put together by hundreds of people. Yeah. Um, how many Beatle books do you own currently? Oh, gosh. I mean, I'm going to go with a low estimate because they're all over the room. I'm going to say, I, I think 500 is low. Um, it's it's way more, but it's nothing like, have you ever seen Mark Lewison's room where all of his are? No. It's like a library. And I mean, I, that's all I spend my money on. People give me memorabilia and I appreciate it and I love it and I treasure it, um, but I don't spend my money on it. I only buy books. Anytime that I get any money, I buy books. And if there's anything left over, we eat. So, you know, I mean, it's, that's what I do because I have to have the information. Right. I mean, you wouldn't be able to do it without a book. I mean, no, no. I, mean, I don't know how you did any, some of this without the internet because I mean, the internet didn't exist until no. like, I mean, people didn't get computers really until like 2000. I right. Mean, writing physical letters by mail I yeah mean, email can <laughs> look as an old school form now which is scary yeah I did the very first book on a brother word processor and I printed it on lined paper and I have that manuscript there it is on I tore it out of a a, a loose leaf notebook and put it in the brother word processor printer and here is this archaic typed manuscript on this raggedy lined paper. You know, I mean, things were so different. I couldn't watch the concert that I was writing about so that I could see when George did that little shuffle dance yeah. or, you know, when the face that John made or the fact that John had, had loosened his tie and was chewing gum. I couldn't see that and now I can. And it makes me sad because some of the things that I had referenced in Shades of Life, like I had a fantastic video of John on Not Only But Also with Dudley Moore, and they've pulled it. So I got to see it, but now others can't see it. And I just don't think it's fair. I wish that it would be left up there in public domain for everyone to see. It's unfortunate that you, that there's, ridiculous copyright standards I, know. I mean I know everybody wants their money but I know <laughs> I'd be willing to pay I'd be willing to pay a fee to watch it yeah I mean it would be so cool if you could like upload it to your site yeah with a QR code right right and you had to pay yeah it wouldn't be like you were taken away but you know you know and I use the QR codes in the book but I had to check because as quickly as things were coming available, many of them were disappearing. And we had to remove like five of the QR codes because the video was gone. So my favorite story in there is the Beatles performing in France, the very first night of the European tour. They are on fire. I mean, the last time in January of 1964, when they're in Paris, it's mainly men, mainly boys. Right. There are no girls there. There's no screaming and they're very lukewarm. I, I think they enjoyed the music, but there's Beatlemania is not in play. Yeah. So then they come back in 65 and it's 
as, as John and Paul told Larry Kane in the Bahamas, it's out there. Anything can happen. You know, it is, oh, what a great, and that, that concert is still available in audio so you can hear it. And I mean, that just was so fun to write because you can hear what they're saying and what they're doing. And it's just, it's great. Yeah. What do you think is the most important book out of all of the ones that you've written? Important? Um, well, it's got to be Tune In, you know, and the others that are to come. I mean, there's, yeah, you know, there are other ones that I love and that I cherish, like John Lennon, 1980, uh, Ken Womack's great book that, I was scared to read um, because I thought it would be too sad, but it's anything but that. And it's not about 1980. <clears throat> it's about the 1970s up to 1980. Right. I mean, including 1980, but it's about the whole of the 1970s. Um, I, I cherish that book, but is it the most important? Well, no, because it's only about John, you know, um, but how could you not, I don't know what else you would choose if you didn't choose Tune In, right? Right. Did you ever talk to Pete Best? Yes, many times. Oh, that's many awesome. times. Um, Pete, I called Pete the very first year that I was in Liverpool, just a cold call. And um, he said, yeah, I'll meet and have lunch with you for such and such amount of money. And I had already paid 150 pounds to visit with Alan Williams, who became a good friend of mine. And after that, we met many more times and got kicked out of a lot of places together. Oh. <laughs> <clears throat> a lot. You know, they called him the Bard of Liverpool because he was barred from every place in Liverpool. Oh, yeah, we went, we went to a lovely French restaurant and went with Beryl Adams, who he was living with at the time. Beryl used to be married to Bob Wooler. And then after she and Bob divorced, she really became interested in Alan and vice versa. But we were at this very nice restaurant on Button Street, right near Matthew. And um, he had had a couple of glasses of wine and he started leading the entire restaurant in the Welsh national anthem. And we were asked to leave. <laughs> and that isn't uh all of the story. I mean, it just, there were many instances, including the, my favorite night of my life. But um, yeah, you know, it's those, thank goodness, Hudson, thank goodness that I was able to, to like Beryl is gone now, Beryl Adams, because she worked with Brian at NIMS, Bob Wooler is gone now. So many of these people, I would, Sam Leach, I, I knew them all really well. And Pete, after Pete found out that my heart was in the right place and I wasn't there to cut him out um, through David Bedford and um, other people, Pete and I got to really know each other. And when I was doing the John Lennon hour on Beatles Arama, he came on the show and we've talked many times since then. He's, he's a wonderful person. That's so cool. I got to talk to Pete sometime if I ever can. Yeah, and Rogue, of course, Rogue is just, uh, you you gotta love him. He is, he makes me smile from the minute he starts talking. I know. He's, he just, he's funny. <laughs> he is the only person that I enjoyed more than Rogue, and he's not with us anymore either, was Dennis Ferrante. And he was John Sound engineer during the 70s and up to 1980. And he was the sweetest, most vivacious, funniest person ever, ever, ever. And he was invited by John on December the 8th to meet him for dinner after they left the studio. And he said, John, I've got so much work to do. I just got to go. I just got to stay here and work. And I can't really go to dinner. But I mean, if they'd gone to dinner, he may still. Yeah. That, that's really scary to think about. Yeah, yeah. It, he was a deep regret of his life, you know. And if there's one thing I could ever say to people, it is that the night that my mother passed away, she looked at me and said, I didn't get to do the stuff I wanted to do. And do the stuff you want to do. You know, make it a priority to do the stuff you want to do. Because we don't know. We have no idea. No. What was, John was 40. I mean, 41 years ago. Yeah. 
Now, Jude, I want to thank you so, so much for coming on the show. Now, That's, thank you. It's, don't thank me. Thank you. Thank you. Because you know what? When I said, how do I get the word out? How do I tell people about the book? You're doing that. Thank you. Now, can, can you tell us where to find the books? John Lennon series dot com pretty easy john lennon series dot com and shades of life is a two-part book it only goes from the first of january 1965 up to the day that the beatles step on the plane to go to the united states for the north american tour of 1965 it's eight months of of things that are going on and i am working away on part two right now but because it's a two-part book i ordinarily um, charged $29.95 for the books. And I made it $25 uh, because I really wanted people to be able to afford to read the book. Um, is it coming out on ebook? I hope so. If we survive this metamorphosis of moving all the, th all the documentation to the back of the book. But it is also on Amazon and it is at thefest.com, which is our beloved Fest for Beatles fans. I hope I'll see you there in April. Are you going to come to it? Maybe. Okay. Yes, let's hope. Yeah. I would be so excited. Yeah. We we would get into too much trouble. We might get kicked out like I did with Alan Williams. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but at least you won't say to me what he said to me when I asked him to dance with me. Oh god. Yeah. But that's kind of a, a badge of honor. Yeah. <laughs> and, if people want to get in touch with you, how can they do so? Uh, I They can email me directly, rjcast at comcast.net, or they can go through my agent, Nicole Michael at 910 Public Relations, 910 PR. Um, and I'll be glad to, I, every book that I sell, every one, I sign and date. And um, if people want me to inscribe it, I will, but... I don't do it unless they ask for me to do it because it, it does not make the book as valuable. And as you know, some of these books are selling for crazy prices. So. I sell my organs. <laughs> so, you know, if they want it inscribed, I will, but just be warned. Thank yeah. you so, so much, Hudson. This is always a joy. You are such a, a, a smart and really soundly based Beatles expert. And I'm always just a little bit nervous, but always grateful to be on the show with you. Don't ask me any Paul questions. You know, I don't know. Oh, we, we, we know your favorite Paul song, Let Him In, right? <laughs> <laughs> Someone's knocking at the door. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But Kid O'Toole saw me get up and dance to some song and some egg LP. <laughs> Back to the egg. <laughs> There you go. And she said, I'm recording this for posterity because I think you were enjoying dancing to that song. Well, you were at the fest. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Alcohol could have had something to do. With oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> and you can win a copy of Shades of Life if you send an email to solo Beatles podcast at gmail.com. Um, I'll let the contest run for two weeks starting today when this goes out and it is signed and dated and I, I will include a little sign and scribe sticky note <laughs> if you request from me even though I don't think that does include any value <laughs> and if they want I will also write them a little note and mail it to them personally so that they can tuck it into their book if they wanted to inscribe Oh, that's so awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. And yeah. Um, and oh, your podcast. Oh, she said, she said. And the next one will be in January. And we're going to have Richard Porter, Susan Ryan, and David Bedford with their new book, which Hudson has a copy of, and I, I do, do not. The Beatles Fab Four Cities, Liverpool, Hamburg, London, and New York. And I'm guessing I know which one Susan wrote for sure. New York, New York, a city so nice they had to say it twice. Yeah. Susan is the true New Yorker. Oh, no doubt about it. And she was always my idol. I went to the fest and she was on the stage 
for the author's panel. And I said, someday I'm going to be like Susan Ryan. How long have you been going to the fest? Uh, 16, 17 years, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Long time. Long time. Yes. If you ever go once, you will never not be able to go again. You will have to go. Yeah. It's fabulous. It is one of the, what I've heard, the best experiences. It is. And you don't know what to go to because there's so many things to attend that you have to make a very judicious choice. Um, This year is going to be, you know, because of COVID, I'm going as Darth Vader because I'm getting a mask that has a breathing unit in it. You can see out of it and you can talk to people, but it it circulates the air because I have um, auto compromise in autoimmune diseases but so I'll be there as Darth Vader at oh gosh but I'm going we can get you a box <laughs> <laughs> living in a box living in a cardboard box that'll be me <laughs> uh, yeah <laughs> like like one of those like um genies like like at like an arcade <laughs> put money there in. we go there <laughs> we go comes out there we go I like that Press the button that's what I'll do but I I don't want to miss it and I you know I just I can't take the chance so I'm just gonna have to go in a bubble yeah and it it should be a really good experience yeah April 1st through the 3rd and it's not a joke no (laughs) no no it is this is this is a place that if you're a Beatles fan and you haven't been there you've seriously missed out. And some of the people you may not see again. No. So, you know, I mean, it's it's really important to be there. And it also for all the people that know about the tragedy that befell Billy J. Kramer, the loss of his wife just yeah. a, a few weeks ago, he's going to be there and <clears throat> we all need to rally, <clears throat> excuse me, and be there for him and let him know how much he's loved. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I will be posting the links for Billy J. Kramer, the GoFundMe, because that has really taken a toll on him. Yeah, yeah, and, and yeah. That was a very sudden death. Yes, it was. It really was. And and you know, it just he is a sweet guy. I the very first year, I walked up to him. I was, you know, first fast, and I said, uh, "Billy, I just wanted to let you know." That woman is one of my favorite all-time songs. He goes, okay, I'll let Peter and Gordon know. Oh, God. He's a funny guy, too. <laughs> yeah, well, I was an idiot, an idiot. But um, hopefully he has forgotten that by now. <laughs> <laughs> so, now, of course, I've brought it up again. But anyway, yeah, people, it's, I mean, It is just the Saturday night concert alone is worth going for, not to mention Mark Lewison says he may be going. So, I mean, that's a rare opportunity if he does end up going to to meet him. Well, I mean, yeah, like if I if I got to score an interview with him, there's the chance. Yeah. Phone record during a parking lot. (laughs) That's I had Bob Eubanks did not want to give me an interview and I had interviewed every other DJ that was on the 1964 North American tour and every other promoter, everyone. And so he has no idea who I am. And he ambled down to the marketplace and came up to my table and I spent an hour talking to him. So I got my interview anyway. Oh gosh. 